This is the Georgia Farm Monitor. Since 1966, your source for state and national agribusiness news and features for farmers and consumers about Georgia's number one industry, agriculture. The Georgia Farm Monitor is produced by the state's largest general farm organization, the Georgia Farm Bureau. Now, here are your hosts, Ray D'Alessio and Kenny Bergamy. All right, it is that time again. Time for anything and everything related to Georgia Ag. So glad you can join us for another edition of the Georgia Farm Monitor. I'm Ray D'Alessio. And I'm Kenny Bergamy. First off, a big thanks to all who weighed in on last week's special show from New York. We appreciate your compliments. As for this show, here's what's coming up. First off, another GFB farm tour is in the books. See why this Morgan County feed store is state of the art and how it has served generations of Georgia farmers. Also on the program, we head back to the kitchen for another month of great recipes with Marsha Crowley. And this time she is whipping up some creative dishes using Georgia peaches. And then later, we hit the road with GFB President Gerald Long to see how he continues to build long and lasting meaningful relationships with Georgia farmers. All this and more starting right now on the Georgia Farm Monitor. Well, here in Georgia, pests are threatening the hemlock trees, and if left untreated, they could wipe out all of Georgia's hemlock population. The Monitor's Mark Wildman recently traveled to Georgia's State Arboretum to find out how the Georgia Forestry Commission is working hard to protect this very important tree species. If you live in North Georgia and have a hemlock tree on your land, your hope is it looks a lot like this. But if pests hit, it could end up looking like this. That is why Georgia Forestry Commission Forest Health Specialist Lynn Womack is busy traveling through areas where hemlock trees grow to inspect trees for a specific pest that can wipe out all of Georgia's hemlock trees if it is left untreated. Starting in the 1950s, they found um, hemlock woolly adelgia, which is an invasive insect species. They found it in Richmond, Virginia, um, probably brought in on an ornamental tree there in somebody's yard or in an arboretum. And it has since spread um, through the entire range of, of hemlock. We first found it here in Georgia in 2003, and since that time it has spread entirely through the native hemlock range here in Georgia. Landowners, if they know where and what to look for, can easily spot this pest. These are the hemlock woolly adelgid on the base of the needles of the hemlock tree. If you flip the branch under, over, you'll look on the underneath side and see them. They, right now, this time of year, they have their, their waxy wool on them. Uh, they are, the next generation through the summer won't have the wool on them, so they'll be much harder to see. You'll need a hand lens. And then starting in the fall with the next generation, those will put on their wool and you'll be able to see them better through the winter months. Georgia's State Arboretum is in Brazelton at Thompson Mills Forest. And Assistant Forest Resource Manager Bill Lott walks this forest every day to make sure the hemlocks and all other trees are healthy. We have 90% of all the native trees in Georgia on this spot here. It's really a unique place. We like to say it's the best kept secret in Georgia. The hemlocks is a real important tree and uh, the Georgia Forestry Commission came in and doctored them for us and uh, really helped us out because it is an important tree in Georgia. If anyone finds the pest on their trees, there is hope. It's very easy for them to purchase the insecticide and do it themselves. Uh, Forestry Commission ha does in the mountain areas have um, soil injectors that can be borrowed and on loan from those county offices. And the uh, insecticide is easily purchased at any of their farm stores. And it's a, something that's really easy to do. As our hemlocks start to decline, we're probably going to see a lot of different things happen. Some people are worried that the temperature in trout streams is going to be is going to rise because of the loss of the shade that the hemlocks provide. They also provide a lot of nutrients. But as the hemlocks die, we could also have too much woody debris in those streams, which could cause a loss in some, some of the amphibian species that are there. Along with insecticides, experts are releasing beetles that will attack the pest. And the hope is, along with chemical and natural treatments, Georgia's hemlocks will be saved. In Brazelton, I'm Mark Wildman for the Georgia Farm Monitor. Georgia Farm Bureau recently held its annual farm tour, spotlighting agriculture in one of the organization's 10 districts. One of the stops, a hot afternoon in Madison, where we got a chance to visit one feed operation that helps supply a lot of producers around the state. 
It's worth a trip to visit beautiful historic downtown Madison, a community that played a significant role in U.S. history. One of Godfrey's warehouse owners in Madison, Whitey Hunt, told us that J.E. Godfrey bought the current location in the late 1870s. It was originally a cotton warehouse that also sold fertilizer and coal. Godfrey's has been here a long time. Uh, uh, Morgan County used to be a, a large area for growing cotton and peaches back in the 30s and 40s and when the uh, bow weevil hit and the uh, depression hit, people got out of growing cotton and got into the dairy business. And at that time, we started uh, selling feed. The location next to these railroad tracks is significant. Trains were used to deliver coal, cotton, and the addition of feed in the 1930s. The Godfrey Company stopped selling coal and warehousing cotton in the 1960s. Today, they produce feed at their state-of-the-art mill. Of course, at that time in the 1870s and uh, on up to what we were talking about when the bow weevil hit, this was a cotton warehouse. Uh, we sold uh, in the deed, there's reference to a Guana building, which was, I think, which was this building that was over here, what it sounds like, because it was uh, next to the depot. And uh, so it, it has changed through the years. And at that time, there was, uh, we did get some fertilizer in and some cotton was shipped by rail. We still get a lot by rail, but maybe not quite as much as we once did. Um, as a child, I can remember mixing feed, which would be 50 years ago, a little bit, more than 50 years ago. And uh, we've been doing that for that period of time. Uh, feeding the dairy business and, and beef and poultry, well, some poultry in the past. Hunt told me the feed and fertilizer company has changed over the years to reflect the changing needs of the agricultural industry. We've been able to expand. I think if it hadn't been for the computer and then computerize the feed mill, we would not be able to keep up. Uh, uh, we've increased our business several times in my lifetime here. Godfrey's remains involved in supporting the ag community, especially youth education programs, to help ensure that farming continues to thrive in the southeast. Yeah, so we cover pretty much um, all of Georgia. We get down to South Georgia. Uh, the corners probably are left out a little bit. We get over into South Carolina, North Carolina, um, and a little bit into Alabama. And next week on The Monitor, Mark Wildman continues our coverage of the 2016 GFE Farm Tour as he gives us a behind-the-scenes look at the J. Phil Campbell Senior Research and Education Center in Watkinsville. Mark's report focusing on why both the facility itself and the surrounding grounds are vital to Georgia agriculture. Again, that's next week right here on the Georgia Farm Monitor. Meantime, the Georgia Farm Bureau was once again the proud host to the incoming Georgia FFA officers. A chance for the group to spend the day at GFB headquarters in Macon and hear from different department members about how the organization supports Georgia agriculture. State FFA Executive Director Ben Lastly said the yearly visit to Farm Bureau by far one of the most important trips these officers make during their term. You know, it's not a coincidence that we begin our year with a new team every year at Farm Bureau. We do some training with them on what it means to be an officer, and the second thing that they do, uh, they come to Georgia Farm Bureau. So it's a great opportunity for them to come here and learn about um, the passion that this group has, learn the structure, and meet the, the people here who are just tremendously supportive of our program. Now still to come on the show, the reason behind President Long's trip to Macon County and why the Georgia Farm Bureau president says trips like this are vital to improving Georgia agriculture. But first, grab you some peaches and an apron and get ready for another delicious edition of Meals from the Field. That is next when the Georgia Farm Monitor continues. My name is Kylie Bruce and I'm from Franklin County. I live on a fourth generation poultry farm, so agriculture has been a huge part of my life and my family's how we make a living for my whole life and my dad's whole life. He grew up on a farm, so he showed a pig and my sister was showing pigs. So of course I had to show a pig being the little sister. And so that was the first step I took into the National FFA organization and I'm so glad I did. 
In two or three years, I hope to see myself enrolled at the University of Georgia pursuing a degree in agriculture, whether it be agriculture education or agriculture communications. I think it's important that we educate the members of our communities locally and on the state level of the importance of agriculture and agriculture education. To learn more about the National FFA organization, log on to FFA.org. Well, somebody came up to me the other day and said, Ray, how you doing? And I said, you know, anytime I'm with Marsha Crowley, I am peachy, just peachy. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Georgia Farm Monitor and to another edition of Meals from the Field. I promise no more jokes. They're the pit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh, I knew that was coming. No, anyway, folks, welcome back. Uh, as always, we do have Marsha Crowley with us. And as you can see, our theme today is peaches. Uh, last month, of course, we did blueberries. Today we are doing peaches, and, and Martha was apologizing to me. She goes, it seems we got this breakfast theme going on because we're doing something breakfast related, but that's completely by accident. Yes. But we do have some good recipes as we always. Do. Let's talk about it. A, a little bit about peaches. We were talking about this before we started uh, taping. Um, the story behind why Georgia is the peach They state. were the first state to have commercial peach production. Okay. And right now, as far as peach production in the United States, They're third. Third. Just over, I think, 35,000 tons, I something, think it is, yeah, something that like that. Yeah, that sounds right. And uh, whereas California, number one in production with 620,000 tons. So that but they're not, as good as, they're not as good as Georgia peaches. They're not as good as Georgia peaches, though. But what do we have today? All right, we're doing a, um, a peachy chicken salad. Mm -hmm. And the, there's several key things with this. You bake the chicken. You don't boil it, which is traditional. Okay. To me, when you boil chicken some of the flavor comes out of it so you bake these with a little olive oil salt and pepper okay okay you're going to add to that a cup or to a cup and a half of georgia peaches the best peaches in the world they are you? really the sweetest and the best <laughs> a cup of chopped celery and this is a, a good basic chicken salad recipe too which you could add you know but it's really good with peaches and this is um a tablespoon and a half of fresh chopped tarragon, and that's key. Don't use the ter dried tarragon that's in a jar. Okay. And you can buy that in the produce section if you don't grow it in your garden, which I don't. I've never had any luck with it. A little bit of salt and pepper, and a half a cup of mayonnaise. And I'm pretty picky about mayonnaise. I usually try to use a, a name brand. Um, I think mayonnaise makes a big difference. Okay. Any... Um, in particular, mayonnaise with maybe initials MW or starts with an H? No, or? that's Miracle Whip. That's not <laughs> mayonnaise. So just regular mayonnaise? Yeah, regular man Miracle Whip, no, would make a big difference. You okay. stir this up, obviously. And you could serve this with um, your favorite buttermilk biscuit with a, like a cup of chopped peaches in it. Uh -huh and a, a little bit of cayenne pepper or some fresh chives or whatever and have a really good um, lunch, luncheon. Okay, we're gonna put this right over there. How's and that? And we got the finished product over here for you. And it is really Look good and fresh. Look that is, you know? Good, we're good and fresh. Good and fresh. I like that, okay. Okay. Moving All on. All right, the next thing is a make ahead overnight French toast with peaches or peachy French toast. So in this um, eight by eight or nine by six pan, this is 10 slices of French bread, about a half an inch thick and you cube it. All right, you're gonna um, add to that four eggs beaten, a cup of milk, Like I said, you can make this ahead, which, you know, I kind of stuck on that too. I don't like to, obviously don't like to get up in the morning and cook mm -hmm. a big breakfast. A teaspoon of vanilla. And the bread won't go stale, obviously, you know. So no, you not overnight. If you, cover, if you cover it and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, a quarter of a cup of sugar. And you're going to pour this mixture after you add the peaches to it. Here we go. This is two to three peaches sliced. You can evenly put those over the top of the bread. And like I said, this is really good. And a cup of chopped Georgia pecans. So you could call this a make-ahead 
Georgia casserole if you Absolutely. want Absolutely. And it's not too sweet. You might think it's too sweet, but it's not. Believe me, I don't like sweet, so I try to. All right, now you're going to add this mixture to it. Pour this over the top. And you're going to cover it and put it in your refrigerator three hours or overnight. And you know me, I did it overnight. Overnight. <laughs> yeah, overnight. And when that comes out of the oven, you bake it at 350 for like 30, 40 minutes okay. until it's brown. When that comes out, you're going to top it with, this is almost like a cobbler topping. This is brown sugar and flour. And you would do this after it comes out of the oven or right before you put it in the oven. And two tablespoons of butter. And you spread that evenly on the top. And I have done it um, before I put it in the oven. And for the purposes of TV, we'll go ahead and fast forward and show you the finished product. Actually, they like are mirror images. Images. Yeah. That's, I'm impressed. There you go. So you know it, it works. It's a it real does live, work. It's a real live recipe. Good stuff. Good stuff. Um, right. Like I said, bake that at 350 for about 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. And then you could serve, this is the topping that goes on top. You could serve that with powdered sugar okay. on top and your favorite syrup, or you could leave it alone. So this little topping is kind of crunchy. All right, nice. And then our final our final thing, you're just going to talk about these. I guess these are your little biscuits. That's, that's the biscuits. with you, you add like a cup of chopped peaches to your favorite buttermilk biscuit oh, okay. recipe. Okay. I mean, I know everybody in your audience knows how to make biscuits a whole lot better than I do. So We are in Georgia. Yes, we are in Georgia. <laughs> and in so, the South, so there you go. And that's not my... Uh, not my forte, making fresh biscuits. No. Well, folks, as always, you can find all these delicious recipes by logging on to gfb.org slash recipes. Uh, like we keep saying, Marsha does a great job every month of sending us those, and we put them up there for you. Have a lot of feedback from people, Marsha, always telling us how much we love the recipes. Good. So keep them coming, please. I will. Good seeing you. Thank you. And we will see, see you guys month. next month. Ray, Marsha, great job as always. When we come back, Georgia Farm Bureau bids an emotional farewell to one of its longtime field reps. A conversation with the now retired Don Giles. Stay tuned. My name is Don Giles, uh, recently retired field rep from the 6th District of Georgia Farm Bureau. Uh, worked in that position for 37 years enjoyed every minute of it. Field rep, is, in my opinion, is the liaison between the County Farm Bureau and, and the Home Office. And we wear, wear a lot of different hats. Uh, part of our job is working with the County Office, the County Office staff. Large part of it is working with the volunteer leaders. So uh, every day is a little bit different. Uh, and uh, we have a lot, of, a lot of challenges. We both started our careers about the same time. I came on Lawrence County in 79 and I was told, we, we did not have a young farmer committee, and I was told to establish a young farmer committee. And a year later, I was struggling with it. Uh, I didn't have any uh, much help. And a year later, Don showed up, and uh, he was a big help in helping me get started with the committee here in Lawrence County. My name is Mary Mars. I'm the office manager with Lawrence County Farm Bureau. I've known Don for 33 years. I've had a great working relationship with Don. It didn't matter what I asked him to do, he was always there ready to help me do. No matter how, how large or how small the job was, he, everything was fine. Mary and I were talking uh, the other day, looking back over the 35 years he's, he's been with us, and uh, I have never recalled him ever saying no to me uh, for anything I've ever asked him to do. On the night that Christ uh, washed the feet of the disciples. Uh, he said the greatest example of love is to serve other people. And uh, I realized really quick with this job that it gave me an opportunity to serve other people and to serve a group of agricultural people, rural people, and uh, some great people. And that's one of the reasons that I've stayed for 37 years. Don's legacy, it will be a friend of Farm Bureau. It'll be a friend of the people he came in contact with. 
He's a good Christian man. Uh, he's just a joy to work with, and uh, that's the legacy he, he leaves with me. I've always been told that you really are really a blessed man if you can have four or five people that you call close friends. And the position that we've had uh, with the people that I've worked with, especially the field reps, um, I've had more than four or five close friends. It's, it's like a family, and it's really one of the things that kept, kept all of us, I think, together for such a long period of time. We have five guys right now on the staff that are that 30 plus years, so it's really been a blessing. And, uh, feel like part of my family. I uh, wish them the best of luck, and retirement's great. Well, finally today, since taking office, Georgia Farm Bureau President Gerald Long has made it a priority to meet with county presidents and board members and to answer any questions they may have about the organization. Recently, Damon Jones spent the day with President Long as he paid a visit to the 8th District. While he's only been on the job for a few months, Georgia Farm Bureau President Gerald Long has already logged some serious miles, hitting face-to-face -face with organization leaders and county presidents all around the state. And the reason is pretty simple. They're the ones with the boots on the ground. They know what's going on in each county. They know the needs. And a lot of times they have the solutions to a lot of our issues. And that's what we're here for, is to listen to them and to communicate with them. And Long believes that communication is the key for this organization to best serve the farmers on a daily basis. It's an open communication that he hopes these visits to different operations around the state represent. Explaining what we're doing and making, the steps we're taking to, to make this company a stronger, more viable company. Uh, I think it's very important for me to come out and, and talk to the county presidents and county leadership to explain to them as the new president of Georgia Farm Bureau, my goals and my responsibilities as president. One stop along the way was Clay County President Joe King's farm. King, who is a new county president, has many goals in mind, but one in particular. What I wanted to do is get more young people involved. We have very few young farmers in, in, our, in our county, and we, uh, farmers are aging, and, and we want uh, you know, for it to carry on in, in a good way with good young men that, that are informed and are educated. Macon County President Mike McClendon also got a chance to meet with Long as he passed through the district. And with more than 30 different commodities being grown in this county, he believes it's a great idea for the state president to get an up-close look. Just, just for everybody, the politicians and everybody to know something about what we have here and the support that we need for farmers, need from them, from the Farm Bureau. And, and uh, I think it's a good thing for him to be out seeing folks. It's a sentiment shared by Long as he hopes to not only give information, but also receive some as well. It's been a great experience to get out and visit with them and, and get their ideas. You know, and I'm, I'm challenging them. Not only do I want questions, if they've got some solutions, I'm looking for them also. And these trips are more than just information sharing as it also gives everyone a chance to build a stronger rapport. Because you like to have a personal relationship with who you're dealing with. And, and talking to Mr. Long, I understand who he is even more than just seeing him on TV or, or uh, a clipping in a paper. You know, that, that personal, he's a farmer just like we are. He's, he, he's in a different spot. He grows vegetables and we, we're more row crop. But, uh, but we still have that common interest. We like to produce something. Yeah, he's, he's one of us. He's, he's a farmer. So we... Uh, we enjoy being around him and, and talking with him. Reporting from Macon County, I'm Damon Jones for the Georgia Farm Monitor. Great job, Damon. Thank you so much. Well, that is going to do it for this week's edition of the Georgia Farm Monitor. Just a reminder for all the latest ag info regarding food, great recipes, and what's happening down on the farm, be sure and check out our Twitter, Facebook, and Pinterest pages. You'll stay informed and see what's up in the world of farming and the Farm Monitor show. Take care, everybody. We will see you next week right here on the Georgia Farm Monitor. Have a great week.